Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nirav Shah, the director of Maine's Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm joined this afternoon by Commissioner Jean Wambrew from Maine's Department of Health and Human Services. Commissioner Wambrew and I are delighted to be able to join you all this afternoon to provide an update on where we are with COVID-19 or across the state of Maine for today, Thursday, January 21st, 2021. We begin today's update on yet another sad note. Maine CDC has received the reports of six additional Maine people who have died with COVID-19. The six additional deaths reported today include two residents of Cumberland County, one resident of Kennebec County, one resident of Penobscot County, one in Washington County, and one resident of York County. Five of the individuals who died were men, and one is a woman. Three of them were in their 70s, and three were in their 80s. These six additional deaths bring to the total number of individuals who have died with COVID-19 in Maine now to 536. And their deaths come at a time when the United States has just exceeded 400,000 deaths across the country associated with COVID-19. We, we would like to take a moment to offer all of the friends, family members, and communities of all 536 individuals in Maine to say nothing of the over 400,000 across the United States, to offer them our deepest condolences during this continued time of stress and grief. Right now in Maine, there are a total of 35,638 COVID-19 cases, representing an increase of 675 individual new cases since yesterday. Of those, 28,999 are confirmed, 6,639 are probable cases. Cumulatively, 1,294 people have been hospitalized. And right now in Maine, 182 people are hospitalized with COVID-19. 54 of them are in the ICU and 21 of them are on a ventilator. Among all of our 35,000 cases, 3,575 are among healthcare workers. <clears throat> Turning next to where we stand with respect to outbreaks. And there is one outbreak, uh, epidemiological outbreak investigation that Maine CDC has recently opened that I wanted to comment on. And that is an outbreak at the Franklin County Jail where we are aware of four cases of COVID-19. We are working with the authorities at the Franklin County Jail to again ensure that they have everything they need in terms of PPE, testing supplies, and public health guidance to keep their res to keep their inmate residents as well as their employees safe. Turning now to testing, let's start with PCR tests. Our seven-day PCR positivity rate is now at 4.1 percent. That represents a decrease just in the past several days. Indeed, about a week ago, it was a full percentage point higher. Much of that decrease is a function of increasing testing volume. Indeed, the PCR testing volume in Maine right now stands at a near high of 780 PCR tests for every 100,000 people. Antigen testing has been a bit more stable. The antigen test positivity rate now stands at 6.55%, and antigen testing volume is at 174 test results for every, I'm sorry, 174 tests for every 100,000 people. Turning next to a discussion of where we are on vaccines and vaccination. Let's start with the numbers first. Overall, cumulatively, there have been 92,008 doses of COVID-19 vaccine administered across the state. Of those, 74,760 our first doses, and 17,248 Maine people have received both of their doses 
of the COVID-19 vaccine. I'd like to turn now to provide an update on something we talked about on Tuesday. And that is around 4,400 doses of Moderna vaccine that arrived in Maine out of the temperature range. As we talked about, we, we, we became aware of those boxes, those shipments by recipients who noted on, that on the outside of the box, the temperature monitor, rather than having a green check mark on it, had a red X on it. They alerted us immediately, and we in turn immediately alerted Operation Warp Speed and the US CDC to let them know that these shipments could have been potentially compromised. The emphasis here is on the word potentially. We have been communicating since then with Operation Warp Speed and the US CDC, and they in turn have been working with the manufacturer, Moderna, as well as the distributor of these vaccines. The reason that we are utilizing that system is because this phenomenon of some doses arriving out of the temperature range happened not just in Maine, but also in some other states, for example, in Michigan. Here is what we know right now. According to the distributor, McKesson, some of the gel packs that are used to maintain the appropriate temperatures during shipping on Sunday were actually too cold. Initially, our concern was that the reason the temperature alert was activated during transit was that the vaccine had gotten too warm. But now, Operation Warp Speed and, and the distributor, McKesson, believe that the reason the boxes had that red X on them was not that they were too warm, but perhaps that they had been too cold. The reason I focus on that is that being too cold increases the chances that the vaccines that were delivered to Maine, those 4,400 doses, can eventually be used. That's because vaccines of this sort are generally more stable in cold environments. But the devil is in the details. How cold actually was it? And for how long? And for what and what impact may that have had on the stability of the vaccine overall? Those are questions that the scientists at the manufacturer, Moderna, are investigating and hopefully answering for us very soon. Let me be very clear about a couple things. Number one, not one of those doses has been administered to anyone in Maine. If and only if the scientists who are experts in vaccine stability determine that these doses are fully safe and fully effective, could they then be used? Number two, as soon as we became aware of this situation and it determined the extent of it with those 4,400 doses, we immediately notified Operation Warp Speed, which as I talked about on Tuesday, dispatched replacement doses. All 4,400 of those replacement doses have arrived in Maine and thus our ability to keep vaccinating folks has only been slowed down only minorly because of that one day on Monday. Again, the replacement doses have arrived and they, those shots are going into people's arms. None of the doses that were too cold has been administered. Now we do not at this time know when federal officials and scientists will complete their analysis of what precisely happened here and what it means for the ultimate viability of this vaccine. For now, we have asked those who receive the vaccine to keep it in the frozen environment, but cordoned off until we learn additional confirmatory details. And finally, I wanna underscore, as I talked about on Tuesday, that there is a process in place to spot instances of this sort. And in this situation, that process worked exactly as it should have. The process is, to ensure the safety of vaccines from the site of the manufacturer to the site of administration. And that process, as we've discussed, is multi-layered and thorough. In this situation, the system worked as it should. Recipients of the vaccines notified us immediately. We notified Operation Warp Speed and the US CDC immediately, and they began their investigation into what went wrong and what it means for the ultimate viability of the vaccine. As we know more, 
we will of course keep you updated. So with that, I would like to turn things over to our colleagues for questions. And the first question of the afternoon goes to Joe Lawler at the Press Herald. Uh, yes, hi, thanks. Just uh, something to super quick clarify and then moving forward with my questions. Are you, are you certain that it was too cold versus too warm or that is still to be determined? That is still to be determined, Joe. That is the operating hypothesis that is investigate, being investigated based on statements that McKesson made to the US CDC in Operation Warp Speed that they had determined that the gel packs were not left out to be thawed to the appropriate temperature, but rather were just tossed into the boxes. So the operating hypothesis right now is that the temperature exceedance was on the low end, not on the high end. But again, until the investigation that the US CDC and Warp Speed are conducting is fully complete, we won't know for sure. Okay, thank you. I have two questions for Commissioner Lambrew. Uh, the first question is about um, independent doctors and, you know, who are not part of a, a network or even part of, say, Intermed or Martin's Point, but just have their own, um, you know, hung their own shingle out. Uh, how are they going to uh, vaccinate their patients? What what is the um, what is the plan for them? So to start out with, we are at the beginning phases of opening the doors to people seventy years and older. As Dr. Shaw has mentioned, our vaccine supply has been extremely limited. Uh, the week the, the week seven allocation, which we'll be announcing later on today, is seventeen thousand five hundred seventy five. That's less than last week. So we continue to try to focus on, first of all, finishing those 1A healthcare workers themselves. We want to make sure that those independent providers themselves are vaccinated. So we're trying to connect them with local hospitals or other sites that are doing larger throughput to make sure that they themselves get vaccinated, as well as our public safety first responders and long-term care residents. As we turn to the 70-plus-year-old group, we are hopeful that very soon we can continue to build out our distribution sites into sites that are more dispersed in rural Maine in smaller sites. But at this point, our vaccine supply remains significantly limited. Okay, thank you. My, my second question is um, just with the news uh, yesterday about uh, yellow for sports and extracurricular activities uh, being allowed to practice and et cetera, allowed to continue on. What, what were the what was the the tipping point the the major factors that uh, had you folks um, you know changing changing your mind on that issue? Well, we did find that there was some confusion around the community sports guidance, which included references to the health and human services health advisories that were designed specifically to give school leaders guidance on whether or not is safe to have in-person learning. So we recognize that there was mixing apples and oranges. So we we consider taking that out in conversations with main principals associations and the school boards and the uh, superintendents. We did have a discussion about what is going on in schools and does it make sense for there to be a mandate that there is no practices, for example, in all schools in yellow counties when some of those schools in yellow counties are able to do in-person learning because our county colors are advisory. They're not mandatory for in-person learning. So we, I think the Maine Principals Association decided to remove that requirement that no school sports can occur in those counties that are yellow, leaving those decisions alongside those about in-person learning to school leadership. But it's important to note that this does not change the protocols that the organizers and participants in school sports and community sports must follow to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Those protocols, including wearing face masks, not participating in competition statewide, and limiting close contacts whenever possible. It also remains advisable to cancel gatherings like sports events in communities with large outbreaks where there's a high positivity rate, there, where there's some other, other indicator of elevated COVID-19 risk. So that has not changed. What has changed is uh, aligning the decisions about school sports with decisions about school in-person learning um, at the local level. 
Thanks, Joe. I'm going to turn it over to Brian Sullivan next. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. I would be interested to know uh, what, uh, if anything, you uh, took away from the, the Biden administration. Have you have you heard from officials uh, under this new regime and what may be different uh, today than it was a week ago, if anything? Commissioner, I'll let you start. I've, I've, got, I've had some communications as well, but I, I know the commissioner has as well, so we can both chime in. Yep. So... Uh, there is, uh, as of today, with the executive order that President Biden signed into, signed uh, a new structure for leadership in coronavirus task force uh, activity, and that is led by uh, Jeff Zients. Uh, Mr. Zients did call Governor Mills last week to make that introduction, to make that connection, to make sure that we had communication at all levels in the governor's office, at the commissioner's level, at the CDC level. Uh, we are hoping that those lines of communication will continue as well as support. In one of the executive orders, for example, today, uh, President Biden did direct that there be 100% federal funding for FEMA-related National Guard activity and testing activity. So there's already access in the access to additional funding for the work that we're doing. There will be a testing board that will help us test more people in Maine, and we are hopeful with examples of what we were discussing today about communication, about our allotment, about the supply, that those answers will come quickly. Similarly, Brian, as has the commissioner, I've had the privilege of having some discussions uh, with various members of the then transition team and now administration. Uh, given all of our focus in Maine, or across, sorry, across the country, and the, the concerns around vaccines and vaccination, uh, I have focused a lot of my outreach and communications with the uh, newly installed uh, vaccination coordinator, a gentleman named Dr. Bashara Shuker, who I had the privilege of knowing and getting to work with back when I was uh, in Illinois. And Dr. Shuker and I have had the opportunity to have several conversations uh, as you can imagine, I have asked him questions around what he sees as the incoming supply of vaccine, uh, what the allocations may look like in subsequent weeks so that we can start planning. He, of course, is getting up to speed and getting all the facts, but I have been delighted in, the, in, in just in the recent days in the transition and just even this morning with the communication and transparency that he and his team have shown to the states uh, about what they know, what they're seeing in terms of production ramps, and when they hope to have more information about all of that. They, they conceded that they're gathering information right now, the pledge to share it with states as soon as they've got it. And I guess just going off of that, uh, based on what you've heard from them, and all, all the states have been uh, tasked with coming up with their own plan to, to roll out the vaccine. Uh, do you anticipate a federal plan coming? And would it be difficult to course correct or change what we're currently doing if they issued something uh, that was different than what's currently being um, done in the state? So what we've heard President Biden say to date is that there will be greater and more intense federal leadership on testing, contact tracing, and vaccination. He has also acknowledged that states have been doing this work, that there is a role for state, and that the federal government aims to be supporting states in their work, I think it's too early to tell how that relationship will manifest itself. But I do think that there will be um, greater leadership, greater resources, and greater direction coming from the federal government. So I guess just to, that just means maybe more money and uh, transparency about what's coming down the line? I, I think it's Day two of the new administration, I think we're, we saw a lot of action in the executive orders this morning. I didn't see, I don't think there's yet a full-blown plan, and there probably shouldn't be. I mean, I have myself been, worked at the White House in the second day of taking office and getting the facts, getting the existing plans, making sure that you are syncing up with what's going on both at the federal level and the state level is really critically important. So I think we need to give them a little bit of time to do that kind of work as they develop their vision for how we as a nation, as well as states, move forward in this important enterprise. Thanks, Brian. Uh, we're gonna turn over to Amy Brown next. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Uh, what does it mean, if anything, that after last Friday when we saw 823 new cases, there was a period of about four days 
when each day the total number of new cases was about half of that. It started to swing back up again. Um, just wondering if this is a, because of a bottleneck in testing or if it indicates that the surge was starting to have a lull and now we're seeing another peak in the surge or does it mean anything? Um, it, so Amy, you, you are correct as to the day of week effect that we have observed that almost every state that the country observes and it has to do with the manner in which folks are tested. This day of week effect is not recent. It's uh, if you go back and take a look at the the number of cases going back to the beginning of the pandemic, you see that sawtooth pattern that repeats itself. And a lot of that has to do with the, the mores of how folks go to the doctor or when they get tested. Most folks, generally speaking, get tested on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then those results get reported out on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then we report that or reported by the lab. They then appear on our in our data on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And that just has to do, that's really what governs the day of week effect. It's actually been investigated by epidemiologists to see if there's something deeper happening. And it seems to have more to do with the patterns of how folks seek healthcare and get tested than anything else. So that and along with the uh, positivity rate, the PCR positivity rate being down, which is a relic of more testing, uh, those signs aren't necessarily signs that we're heading in the right direction. Both of those can be explained by other things. Well, you know, what I, what I would say, Amy, is that's the trend that matters. It's not so much Monday, uh, Saturday and Sunday versus Wednesday and Thursday. It's the overall trend on a seven or 14 day period, um, and, and rather than the day of week effect, which, which as I mentioned, has been relatively well observed. Um, and to your point about the various pieces of data, one thing I would note is that the, the various pieces of data, be they testing numbers, numbers of cases, positivity, hospitalizations, they all tell us something about the contours of the pandemic, but they do so with different vantage points and time frames in mind. Testing, for example, is a, really an indication of what happened seven, eight days ago when someone started feeling symptoms. Uh, and tells us what was going on with the pandemic at that time. Hospitalizations are an indication of what is happening now, but driven by transmission events that occurred on average 10 to 14 days ago. Positivity rate similarly is driven in part by how many new positive cases there are, but also that denominator of how many folks are getting tested. You really have to take all of them and mash them up. That's one reason epidemiology is fascinating as well as maddening. You got to mash them all up to make sure you're not taking one thing and interpreting it as something that's present versus past. So looking at the last couple of weeks, do you think we're heading in a positive direction or still kind of curving upward? There are signs on the horizon for both. There are signs on the horizon, for example, that because testing is expanded, which has brought our positivity rate down, we are going to be better able to detect more cases. That's a good thing. The more testing we're doing, the higher likely we have of catching cases. So it's difficult to say on its own. I will say I remain concerned about the hospitalization numbers, particularly the increase in individuals who are in the intensive care unit. That number has come down from what it was yesterday, uh, but that number still is high compared to where it was just two weeks ago. There are various factors that we've investigated, but I don't say, I wouldn't say right now that there's a clear picture there are some signs for optimism because testing is expanded, giving us a better view into what's happening, but there simultaneously remain cause for concern because of things like hospitalizations. Thank you. And I have a, just, I think, a quick question for Commissioner Lambrew, if I may. Is there a central number that people can use if they can't get online to try to find out where, if it's their turn, they're 70 or older or a healthcare provider, uh, to find out where they can get tested is anything like that in the works if it doesn't exist? So at this time, there is not a central number. What we are doing is adding to our website, which is the main.gov COVID-19 vaccines website, a list of where people ages 70 and older may contact on the right-hand side. It says if it's publicly accessible or for patients only. So we do encourage people to look at that website. 
Again, because we are supply constrained right now, that list is not as long as we would like. So we are hoping to either have those sites be able to process more people over time as we get more vaccine or find other ways to get to people in Maine. We are looking into the option of some sort of centralized uh, call-in number. We know a lot of people may not have access to the internet, may struggle to do online reservations. So we are absolutely exploring that type of system, but at this point we don't have a specific plan. So should they just call their doctor's office or the local hospital? Uh, that's a starting point. And again, we do have call numbers on the website that are designed to handle these calls. They may be a better place for people to go than calling their own doctor. Well, I'm talking about people who can't get online. We're working to making sure that there's a phone number for every site that's on our website. Right. What I'm saying, though, is for people who can't get on the website, should they just contact their doctor or local hospital? Those are options, as well as, um, you know, calling. Our, we have a 211 system that can help get some of their other information. Dr. Shaw, do you have other ideas on what people yeah. can do as their you know, I, I, it, it's We recognize it's a challenge, Amy. Uh, here's what I would recommend for folks to do. If accessing that website is challenging for them, one thing, and I, I know this is not going to sound right for everybody, but uh, see if there's someone in your life that can help you take a look at that. If, if you can ask them to check their phone to see what the right number in Kennebec is to call or they may be in Maine, that's one step that may be easier uh, for a lot of folks. The second, as Commissioner Lambrew noted, is 211 is available. 211 can help navigate folks to a location that is in their site. Another option is to call their local hospital. That may be a challenge because right now there is much more demand than there is supply. And hospitals themselves are trying to do everything they can to answer the phones as well as to keep their operations going. So I would hold on calling your hospital unless those other options are not available to you. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna turn now to Patrick Whittle at the AP. Uh, thank you very much. I, uh, I and many of us learned earlier today that uh, Maine Health is going to use um, Scarborough Downs as a uh, as a as a max as a mass vaccination site, probably starting as soon as the end of this month. Um, they mentioned that uh, they hope to keep it open for for six months. Um, so I'm assuming that this is a uh, this is probably kind of a question for, for them more than for you, but is, is the idea for these mass sites to remain sort of open for, for all for all phases as opposed to just the one that we're in now? Sure, I'll, I'll start and, and Commissioner can weigh in. Uh, Patrick, that, that is the, for these large scale community facing vaccines, vaccination sites, that is the concept of operations, which is to get them up and running and then have them persist. I can't speak specifically to what Maine Health's uh, duration with the Scarborough site is, but certainly we know as a general matter that to vaccinate everyone in Maine who wants to be vaccinated with two shots in their arm, these sites will, will have to have a high throughput and they're going to have to be open for several months. As you noted, Maine Health would be able to give you a, a finer sense of what their duration is. But let me just say in general, we've been working with them to stand up that site, to help them with the logistics, to supply them with vaccine when the supply allows for it, as well as to help them make sure they've got everything we need. Uh, we commend them and thank them for their partnership on that. We know it's going to be a long road and these large scale high throughput sites will be one of the ways that we can vaccinate high numbers of people at a time safely, as well as with efficiently efficiency. That may take six months, but it may very likely take longer than that. And I'll add two points. Part of the value of sites like this is we have a goal of when vaccines come to Maine, getting them into people's arms as quickly as possible. So having some of these large throughput sites as part of the comprehensive plan that will include other types of delivery systems, pharmacies, smaller, you know, federally qualified health centers, other types of sites, these are important. So we can, if we got maybe 50,000 doses of vaccine next week, instead of 17,000, we could quickly administer them. And I do wanna thank 
Maine Health and Crossroads Holding for their work to set up this site. We are working with other providers and other actors throughout the state. Their willingness to roll up their sleeves, to commit resources. My understanding is that, you know, the, the rent for this facility is $1, which is a contribution to the local communities. And we are grateful for all the people across the state of Maine who at this difficult time are trying to find their own ways to contribute to our effort to vaccinate as many main people as possible. Patrick, if I, if I could, I just want to amplify that, that point really quickly. Please. These large, these large scale community facing sites are a complement to other channels of vaccination, not a replacement for them. We envision being able to vaccinate through vaccinate all pe main people through multiple different channels through whatever channel works for them. It may be a large scale community facing site such as this one and others we're working on. It may be through your doctor's office. It may be at a local hospital. For some Mainers, it may be at your work site. Our, our motto is we will vaccinate people by land, by air, and by sea, by pharma sea, I guess. Um, could, really about my tongue here. Could you uh, sort of go over the, um, some of the logistics of what makes the, the downs a, a, a good uh, candidate to, to provide this? I, I, know, I know it's large, so I'm assuming that the, just the fact that it's a, it's a humongous venue is, has got to be one of them. Or I'm assuming other facets are connectivity to, to transit and um, sort of, uh, you know, accessibility to highways. What are the others? You, 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 tack, you ticked off some of the main ones. Ability to have uh, robust IT connections in place, sufficient parking, uh, such that if we ever converted to a different concept of operations, we would have the ability to use people, have people be vaccinated in their car. It's spacious good ventilation, uh, easy to access, doesn't cause congestion in the roadway. With a little bit of help from uh, other traffic control entities, we can have folks come in at, in their cars in high volume and not cause congestion elsewhere. It just is the location that ticked off a lot of places, a uh, lot of boxes. It's central, but not too central, so as to cause traffic concerns. It, it was just a great location. And again, I'd echo the commissioner's thanks uh, for the great work and the partnership of Maine Health to get that site up and running. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It will soon be up and running. Yeah, we do not yet have the vaccine yeah. once the vaccine supply is available. And I do is also want to thank the town of Scarborough too, because the town of Scarborough right. has, is considering this and will hopefully be supportive of it. Thank you. Is it safe to say that, assuming it does open at the end of, of January, it'll be the first site of its kind in the state? If there's another, it's totally slipped my radar. Yep, no, that, if, if that were the, the right opening date, we believe that would be the first uh, location. Hopefully, it will, there will be others that follow suit in subsequent weeks, again, governed by supply. We're looking at locations in other places in Maine with similar characteristics, the ones that you and I just talked about, Patrick, easy to access for all, sufficient parking, ample space, good ventilation, um, not too many stairs for individuals who are who have mobility challenges, all of those things. We're looking at different sites across the state and hopefully there will be more to come. Okay, thank you very much to you both. Mm -hmm. yep. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, gonna turn it over to Megan at WMTW. Thanks for taking my question. It, um... It relates to outreach to uh, certain communities. I know pre-vaccine, uh, when we were talking about um, just making sure people had access to testing, there were some outreach things that the state did to try and reach um, communities disproportionately affected by COVID-19. So I was wondering, in terms of the vaccine campaign, do you have an element that addresses that as well? You know, there's difficulty getting to places to be vaccinated. Again, we have the issue of uh, difficulty with access to internet. So, you know, how are we reaching these communities? Great. Uh, Megan, I, I want to just make sure I zero in on, I, I, I hear your question to be about just informing folks about where they can be vaccinated, not about sort of a broader confidence campaign around vaccines. Is that right? So just more yes. direct. Okay, got it, got it. So yes. as you note, uh, and, and again, Commissioner and I have had multiple meetings and conversations about this uh, to plan for this. You're absolutely right. It, it, we want these large community facing high throughput sites to be used. 
In order to do that, we have to make it easy for folks to use them. So we're, we're envisioning using different channels of communication, one of which is this venue right here. Once these sites are open, ready to go, and have sufficient vaccine supply, we intend to use these meetings with main people twice a week to talk to them about how to use them in very concrete terms, whether it's a website, whether it's a phone number, whether it's a combination of both. We'll also be making sure we're blanketing the airwaves in other fashions so that we have access that we know is accessible for main people. Using a website may not be available for everybody. Making a phone call may not be your preferred way. So we're going to try to have multiple channels to access these. Unfortunately, getting a reservation will be essential because we don't want to have crowding at the locations themselves. So we think that will be multi-channel approach to not just informing folks that the sites are open, but how they can get vaccinated in them. You mentioned transportation as well, which is something Commissioner Lambrew and I have had discussions around because we know that these sites may be ones where folks need to be brought to in order to use. And I'll turn it over to the commissioner for uh, for comments on how we're working, thinking about that. Sure, so, so we are exploring both directions, I should say, not just bringing people who may have challenges getting to these sites to those sites. We're also exploring how we bring vaccine clinics to local communities, local sites where people who have mobility challenges otherwise need that kind of local access live. So we are looking at this bi-directionally. Um, we're doing this in part by listening to these communities. We know which communities are going to have especially challenging times getting vaccinated. That includes homebound seniors, for example, as we are now in this phase of vaccinating people 70 plus. It includes people of color in certain parts of our state who has struggled to access our healthcare system. We are having dialogues to get their ideas on how best to educate and connect those individuals with vaccines. So as we move through these phases, we are maintaining the two goals of efficiency and speed as well as equity. Um, I have one more question as it relates to quantity of vaccine. So I think roughly it's about 975 fewer doses this week. And um, the week before it was only 100 more than the week before that. And that was kind of disappointing, I think, if I'm, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but I think that we were hoping for more. I think that's exactly what uh, Dr. Shaw said. So now we're looking at a, a thousand fewer. Um, I, I hate to say, uh, you know, one step forward, two steps back, but as we're talking about opening up a huge square footage for, for, for you know, large vaccination sites, we're also talking about 975 fewer vaccines available. So, um, you know, what does this say about... Um, how 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 we proceed? You know, I, I think that if anything, you could determine this as as again disappointing for this week. That's fair. First of all, Megan, your numbers are accurate. Uh, you you are correct. Um, as the commissioner mentioned, we've just finalized what we intend to receive for next, or what we were told we will receive for next week, and it is 975 doses fewer than we received for this week, um, and so that presents challenges. Um, it means that there are tough choices. And for example, we've got to have, there, right now we know the demand for vaccine far outstrips the supply, significantly so. There means there are some really hard choices that have had to be made and will unfortunately continue to be made as it relates to these large scale community sites, such as the one in Scarborough and others that we're bringing on. Right now, a lot of this is in the preparation phase. We want to be ready to activate those sites when the vaccine supply allows. Will each and every one of those sites across Maine be able to do a thousand vaccines per day on the very first day of operations? Probably not, that's okay. The plans are in place to scale them upwards with staff and operations as the vaccine supply allows. So if on the first days of operation, those sites are doing a fraction of that, that is by design. The designs are flexible so that we can turn up the dial as the vaccine supply increases. But I think you're right, and I'll turn it over to the commissioner as well, but having flat vaccine levels is disappointing. That's 
It's the best word for it. It's the only word that I can that I can usually say or really say that sums up my sense of it. It's disappointing. I'll add that we have this question of how much do we know about the pipeline for vaccine distribution at the top of our list for the new administration, because having some degree of predictability feels important. We also hope that we get consistent answers. I mean, a week ago Friday, we were told by Operation Warp Speed that there was no shelf with vaccines stocked up. Um, that Secretary Azar three days earlier has said that there was one. We then this week learned that there might be a shelf with some Moderna vaccine on it because when those 4,300 doses of Moderna vaccine arrived in Maine with that red X on the package, we were able to get replacements within 24 or 48 hours. So that's the kind of information that we hope we can get in um, more uh, predictable quantities in the coming days that will at least help us when we're talking about this type of planning do so better. Thank you both. Thanks, Megan. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Evan Pop next. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Thank you. Um, so I had a, a question along the line of Megan's question about outreach, um, but I want to ask specifically about the new Mainer community. Um, do you think that the state has done enough outreach to that community about the vaccine? Um, I ask because we've heard some concerns from leaders in that community about equitable access and um, also about convincing people in that community that the vaccine is safe, um, given the, the previous history of, of vaccines being tested on people of color in the past. Sure, Evan, um, I'll start there as well. The, let me first acknowledge that there's always more communication that can be done. And the process of communication is not simply, it's not started or finished just because we've launched a campaign or had a webinar. It's an ongoing process and it occurs over weeks and months with multiple meetings and being responsive to new questions as they come out. So at no point, Evan, will I ever say we've done enough communication around vaccine confidence. There is no such point because there are always questions and there's always more conversation that we can have. With that as the backdrop, starting over two months ago, we started working with and reaching out to various different New Mainer communities, be they New Mainers who have joined us from Eastern and Southern Africa, Southeast Asia, and elsewhere, Central Asia and elsewhere around the globe. And we've done so in different manners. So for example, with the New Mainer community of African descent, I had a chance to sit down and have a conversation which we recorded with the editor in chief of Amjambo Africa, where he was able to ask me questions that he had heard from his readers people in his community to put that video online where we could just start talking about questions. There are new questions now, and so we're planning to do the same thing again to make sure that their questions are answered. Again, it's not a single process. It's not a single campaign where we're gonna launch and say, all right, we're all done. We're gonna keep having that conversation. I'm planning on something very similar with the Cambodian community as well to address their specific questions. The last thing I'll mention, Evan, is that when we talk about the New Mainer community, we shouldn't and I don't try to treat them as a monolith. The New Mainer community is comprised, comprises numerous different groups, each of whom have their own questions. We're trying to answer all of those in a thoughtful, particular manner. Can we do more? Certainly. Will we? Absolutely. Um, and just a, a question um, along that similar line. Um, Heard some from some immigrant leaders that um, a possible effective way to get immigrants in Maine vaccinated could be to hold, um, excuse me, to hold some um, vaccine clinics at schools in those communities. And I'm wondering if that's something that the state uh, has plans to do at some point or would consider. We, we certainly have thought about and looked into where and how we can utilize schools and their gymnasiums. That's certainly an option that we are aware of. Uh, right now, our focus is on larger community sites that can accommodate higher traffic flow and even higher throughput than many school gymnasiums can. We haven't ruled that out. And if we get to a position where we have ample and adequate vaccine supply, then we can have all of those options simultaneously, large scale community sites, as well as medium sized ones at schools. I think it's also important to note that many of the efforts that we've undertaken to date 
will already have furnished vaccine to numerous members of the new Mainer communities. For example, many new Mainers work in long-term care facilities in different and varied capacities. That's one reason we felt strongly about activating that aspect of phase 1A to focus on residents and staff, in this case, of long-term care facilities, because we know in many parts of the state, they are significant employers of new Mainers, to say nothing of hospitals. So we're also looking at other venues in which new Mainers work, and all Mainers work, that are high, high velocity, sorry, high population areas, to see if we can work with their employers to get them vaccinated. That's a little bit further down the pike in a little bit different phase, but that's something we're thinking about right now. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna turn now to Rebecca Stefanski at News Center. Thank you, Dr. Shah and uh, Commissioner Lambrew. Uh, my first question is uh, about, well, we know that there's high demand for the vaccine. And um, we're hearing that a lot of people are grateful that they've been pre-registered um, for some programs. And I guess, and maybe this will speak to each individual facility, but um, in many cases, the population that is at most risk for um, COVID is also susceptible to scams. So has any thought been given to when they're reached back out to from these um, places, how to avoid potential bad actors or how to trust where the calls are coming from or something of that nature? Uh, that's a great question, Rebecca. I, I will say, as, um, as 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 the as someone uh, as the son of a elder, you know, older Mainer, I've been worried about that as well uh, because my mom's gotten calls from from people purporting to offer a vaccine. One was legitimate, so that's good. But uh, I I don't I don't have a great answer, Rebecca. I mean, I, I think some of the things that we've talked about throughout the pandemic of you have questions, for example, as we talked about with contact tracers, you have questions about whether the person who is calling you is in fact bona fide and legitimate. Ask for their phone number, ask for their ID number, call back, ask for a general number to call back to. Utilizing those general principles of avoiding scams is I think the, is the first place to start with respect to vaccines and vaccination scams. We haven't heard about any of those happening in Maine. Uh, again, I, I mentioned my own mother. She happens to be in another state right now. But we have, so we have not heard about any of those happening in Maine. If you do hear about them, please make sure you're reporting to them so we can look into them and try to get to the root of the issue. It's a great question. It's something, again, that's been on my mind as well. Um, there, I, I won't, I'll stop there. Commissioner, if there's anything else that I that I should add. But, Rebecca, it's a great question. It's something that I think we need to pay particular attention to. Again, we have not heard of those reports happening with individuals reaching out with spurious offers of vaccines or vaccination, but certainly something we need to keep an eye on. I'm gonna turn it over to Patty White next. I'm sorry, Dr. Shaw, I just actually have yeah. another question. It's Rebecca, so sorry, I apologize. No, go ahead. Uh, the Early, you were um, speaking with a different forum earlier today, and you were addressing um, the question about what will change and what won't change, you know, with the vaccination rolling out and things, and where everyone needs to know that we need to wear masks and continue to social distance. Um, but perhaps that grandparents with a mask on could hug their grandkids um, once they have both doses of the vaccination. And I guess my question is. How will um, accessibility to um, people who live in long-term care facilities, be it skilled nursing or assisted living change um, once the majority of people or whatever, how will it work to allow um, visits to long-term care facilities? Yep, Rebecca, the bottom line there is it's still under discussion. Um, you know what, what I was what I what I noted earlier today, as you said in another forum, uh, was drawn on a, 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 a talk that I was privileged to be able to attend the other evening by a gentleman named Dr. Paul Offit, one of the one of the leading experts in vaccines and vaccine science in the entire world, and and he noted that these vaccines that, that the two that we have uh, ha have performed exquisitely well, exquisitely well, and uh, he felt comfortable uh, after he was vaccinated being able to interact with his grandkids and. Uh, Dr. Offit is again one of the undisputed world experts in vaccines. Um, now, but you you raise a, a broader question, which is uh, 
what does it mean for things like vac uh, visitation policies at long-term care facilities? The data are still out. I don't think any final decisions have been made because although that may be acceptable on a one-on-one -on -one basis where both grandparents have been fully vaccinated and in a controlled fashion, they can interact with their grandkids, that is not the same as a larger scale long-term care facility where perhaps not every single person in the facility has been vaccinated for various and different reasons. And so it's not so much a one-on-one -on -one where just because two grandparents could interact with the grandchild with masks on, that necessarily means that visitation in long-term care facilities can automatically be activated. We're still sorting through what the details and what the best policy is there. Let me just end, Rebecca, by noting what I said to that same forum earlier, which is we recognize fully how much every grandparent in Maine wants nothing more right now than to be able to hug their grandkids. And so we're working to try to analyze the science and the data and to try to be able to put policies and recommendations in place to make that happen as quickly as the science allows and suggests that it's safe. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Patty White next. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. Um, I've got a question about the mass vaccination clinics. You said that there are plans to open up more across the state. Can you tell us how many you're hoping are planning to and what stage in the process are we at? Is it still identifying locations or are things further along? It's a mixture of both, Patty. And let me start first talk about the numbers. We look at these sites again as complements to other existing vaccine channels. And thus the exact number, the final or precise number will be driven by what we believe we need to be at per week in order to achieve 80 plus percent vaccination across the state and what the existing channels, doctor's offices, hospitals, pharmacies are able to, to accomplish. And so we're using that delta between those two to fill the gap, to complement via these large scale community facing sites. So there, it's not as if there will be X number. Uh, we, we, we will keep looking at it to see whether we're on track to achieve whatever we need to do per week. If we are starting to get in a position where we're getting more vaccine in the state than the existing channels can accommodate, then we'll look to try to establish more such locations. Right now, um, we're looking at sites across states, focusing on major population areas, because that is where we will see the highest throughput. Uh, uh, the different locations that we are considering are being done in partnership with local town officials, county ma emergency management, as well as healthcare providers. Uh, I, I won't go too far into the details because the conversations are still very much in flux. Some sites are, are, are a, a bit further along than others. Uh, like Scarborough, like one in Bangor, others are in different stages of planning. Uh, again, it, it's, it's moving very, very quickly. So I don't want to make pronouncements about where each is because literally with each passing day, the ball moves further down the field. It sounds like, is there one in Bangor that may be the, the next one to be kind of up and running? I, I, I don't want to say that, it, that any one of these will necessarily be the next. Again, none of them is open because the supply of vaccine is nowhere near what would be needed to start supporting any of these sites. We hope that's changing very soon, but I, I don't know that, I, I can't predict right now which of these would be or could be the next one to open. Okay, thanks. And for mm -hmm. the um, Maine Health Scarborough Downs uh, Clinic, can you just uh, tell us, I mean, how do you think this will sort of change the trajectory of vaccinations here? Understanding our supply of doses is limited, but that clinic alone, I mean, yeah, how is that going to change? It's going to be a welcome addition. It, it being located it, it, at the cusp of two large population centers between Cumberland County, York County, uh, combined several hundred thousands of people with high the ability to conduct high throughput in a safe, effective manner. It's going to be a big ability for us to kickstart our efforts to get folks across the state vaccinated. The other impact that it will have, Patty, that is um, try to, it will, it will reduce pressure on other parts of the system. So folks who would prefer, for example, to get vaccinated in a smaller venue, for example, at a pharmacy down the street or at their doctor's office, will find that they will have hopefully an easier time to get into those venues because the larger sites will reduce pressure on the network to have everybody go through existing channels. Um, 
I, I don't know if I'm explaining that properly, but, but what it will mean is that we'll take folks for whom getting vaccinated in that large community fashion, for whom that's available to them, means that they will not be utilizing other channels which frees up those channels for folks for whom that is their first preference. It's like there being a bunch of different lines at the grocery store. And when they see congestion happening, they open up even more cashiers. That's what this does. That gradually and collectively reduces pressure on all of the other lines because folks can float over to that new line. And in this case, this new line is an express lane. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the last question for the afternoon goes to Jessica Piper at the BDN. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, first up, a, a quick question. You mentioned at the very beginning of this briefing um, four cases at the Franklin County Jail. And I was wondering if you could say, are those inmates or employees, um, has there been universal testing yet? Um, uh, Jessica, I, do, I will find out for you and we will get to you uh, the composition of those four cases. Um, I was briefed out on this this morning but I don't, but we'll, we'll, I wanna confirm what my recollection is. So we'll get that to you ASAP. Um, and similarly, uh, we, we know that in these situations, universal testing is the recommendation. We will find out if that has occurred yet, or if not, when the Franklin County Jail intends to do so. All right, thanks. Um, and then in terms of trends in the virus, you mentioned earlier the positivity rate being kind of a, a positive sign and hospitalizations being a concern. Um, does any of that have to do with trends in terms of who or like which populations are being infected with the virus? Um, is there any takeaway there? Very good question, Rebecca. Um, I don't have a great answer for you. Um, we, we, from time to time, do take a look at the subgroups that are being tested as well as the location that test results are coming in from. As you can imagine, there's a bit of a correlation. Um, labs that are sending us or hospitals sending us results specimens from Northern Maine versus Southern Maine. And so we do take those, we do take a look at those from time to time. Uh, in, in this setting, uh, Jessica, I, uh, I think I called you Rebecca a second ago, sorry. Jessica, I don't have a great answer. Um, we'll take a deeper look at the data. I don't wanna misspeak or speak before I've had a chance to absorb all the various data points. So unfortunately, um, not a great answer for me to end the afternoon on. I'd rather take a closer look before I, um, before I speak about or discern any trends. All right, no worries, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, very good, well, thank you all for your time this afternoon. We again wanted to just thank you for tuning in now to nearly 160 of these meetings to stay up to date on where we are with respect to COVID-19. Started way back when, well over a year ago, that we started our planning as well as these meetings to make sure that everyone in Maine had all the information they needed to, to stay up to date and safe to provide you with truthful, factual, up-to-date information. We started talking about the virus again a year ago, then PPE, testing, outbreaks. Now, as we move to talk about vaccinations, we know that things are changing really quickly across the state, across the country. There are reasons for optimism. We hope that the vaccine supply increases, and we hope that as we are able to get more vaccine, we're able to get those shots into arms as quickly as possible to get back to that return to normalcy that we all so much are looking for. Commissioner Lambrew and I pledge to do everything we can on our teams that we know are working 24 seven to keep everyone in Maine safe. As we have more information, we will keep you updated. But in the meantime, thank you for your dedication to sticking with us and learning the facts, the truth and the science about where we stand. Have a good afternoon, everyone. We look forward to speaking with you all again on next Tuesday. Until then, please be kind and take care of one another. We'll see everyone soon.